Hello, people are still coming in, so uh, I'll just start briefly until, until we are all in. Um, we actually, uh, our next speaker was actually already on the stage. You have seen him uh, yesterday in the panel. What we have learned only yesterday is that he is very excited about what will come in the future. He really likes technology and he is actually quite in favor of AI, however we define AI. And actually he's also an excellent speaker, so give it up for Chris Hellman. Hello. Um, well, thanks for coming on the last day of this, uh, on the last day and the last talk of this event. I, uh, I'm very much aware that I'm in competition with the free beer outside, and uh, so that's going to be an interesting one. But hopefully, it's going to be worth worth your time and worth your while. I want to talk today about uh, about machine learning, artificial intelligence, and deep learning, and all the things that we're throwing around right now, which are the new hype words and the new hype markets that everybody's getting excited about. Uh, I work for a small company in America that you might have heard of um, that uh, releases a lot of stuff and lately has been doing a lot in that space because uh, we realized that this is where the computing world is going. With a lot of automation that is happening in the world around us is also happening to machines itself. And we also found out that by letting machines do what they do best by repeatedly doing the same things. We can do a lot of things that are good for humans out there as well. And that is what I'm all going to talk about today, how we can make computers and how we can make uh, code and, un uh, and machines make our lives better and make us our st understand ourselves better. So when we talk about machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence and big data, it gets very, very easy to get overwhelmed. I'm following this for like three years now, uh, uh, like officially for my company, and I basically can't keep up. There's a new thing every day where there's a press release that some clever technology from some company will be the future and save puppies and do all kinds of things. There's also no governments know everything about you and uh, everything you see in the news is being faked. Maybe, maybe it isn't. The good thing is we ha had a lot of talks here already by other people at this conference so that talked about bit, uh, some of the bits before. We had that panel where we discussed something. Uh, we had the introduction to deep learning talk, so these videos you can watch later on as well. We had Chris Ward talking about the, the dangers of uh, artificial intelligence and the dangers of automation and believing in technology as a whole. And we had Philip gave a, good, gave a talk about how, uh, how, it deal, how to deal with chatbots and how to make a chatbot that feels like a human to talk to and actually helps your users to get better results faster. And this is what it a lot of time boils down to when people talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, sooner or later, you see it's a chatbot with some natural language processing. Whereas artificial intelligence is a huge endeavor and a great lofty idea. Yesterday on the panel, we completely failed to define what artificial intelligence is. And we, keep, we will keep failing about this because intelligence is hard to find if you follow the news. And artificial intelligence is even harder to make. So the big thing that people are always getting worried about is like that artificial intelligence and deep learning is being used by governments to spy on you and by, uh, by people up there or large corporations or the Illuminati or whatever you want to have. They use all that stuff to know things about you already. And they also keep saying that like it's been recorded without you knowing it and these kind of things. Uh, 1984 is an amazing book. It's also a good film. Uh, I find uh, I live in London uh, and I'm moving to, out of London right now. And I find it wonderful that on the on the home where he wrote 1984, there's a CCTV camera on that building. So this is quite interesting to see. But the point that I want to make with this is that Big Brother is not needed because uh, we've been buying these these cameras that spied on us ourselves. We spent money on them and put them in our pocket and were totally okay when they recorded all of our moves, they recorded all of our conversations, they recorded our face and recognized it and did things with it. So we bought the machines that spied on us years and years ago for convenience. We also happily in entered our personal information into everything online as long as it was free. So we live in a post, uh, in a world where the in a post-data leak world, we've been recognized and recorded. 
What I want us to think about now as technologists and as humans is what do we do with this? Where do we take this information and how do we deal with that? We can just go crazy and go like, oh my God, everything is the, it's the end of the world and we don't know. My biggest problem with conspiracy theories is that they assume that governments are capable. They're not. They're humans as well. They make the same mistakes that we do. They make the same data, data leaks that we have. So I just want to make sure that we get a grasp on what has been recorded about us and what story is there. I want advertising companies to tell me what they think I am. So I get finally get the advertisement that makes sense for me. The other day I bought a suitcase and I, I travel all the time so I thought I spent money and I got a suitcase with a lifetime guarantee. So if the thing breaks, I get a new suitcase. What do I get as advertising from the same company that I bought the suitcase from? More suitcases. It has a lifetime guarantee. I never ever have to buy a suitcase again. Don't, don't offer me other suitcases. You should be cleverer than that. Lots of companies are using the data that we've been given away or we've been voluntarily giving away on, without knowing it, giving it away. Some in amazing ways, other in shady ones. I mean, there's great stuff when personalization works. Excellent. Then you buy things, then you have things, then you find people. When it says, like, you probably want to connect with that person because you got the same interests, that's cool. I don't have to ask everybody what their interests are. There should but only, not only be a few companies that have access to this information and do something with it. I don't want to be only the Microsoft, Facebook, Googles, and uh, Amazons to know these things. I want you to get access to that information and do something good with it. I want the right to see what the government thinks of me. I want the right to think what, uh, what Facebook thinks I am. So let's democratize intelligent machines and human interfaces. So I'm not going to talk about deep learning algorithms or how to use them or use deep learning yourself. The other talks covered that already. I want to go through the concept of learning, how we as humans learn, and what machines do better. And then I'm going to go through all the different approaches that we have that uses AI inside and want you to consider those to use in your interfaces. There should not be any search box on the web anymore that doesn't allow me to enter a sentence. I don't need to be a computer that knows keywords to actually use your information. I should be a human being to, be act to access what you have to give to me. Now, as I said, I'm moving to Germany right now, and uh, my partner uh, uh, works in a company as well that speaks English as the main language, and she was like, okay, I want to do more conversational English. What do we do about this? I want to learn more colloquial terms and do these kind of things. So I bought a, a, a board of Trivial Pursuit, that game where there's facts and then you have to answer. I tried to find an online version of Trivial Pursuit that you can play against each other, doesn't exist. All of them are utter rubbish and ask you for in-app for in payments, don't work offline, don't work with two players. So I thought I, I'd make an effort and spend £3.50 at a charity shop to buy uh, the, the, the real set that we can play with. Now the fun thing about that deck is it's from 1985. So a lot of the information that I thought would be easy for us to talk about and to learn about is completely outdated. We have no clue what it's about. It's about politics of 1985. It's about children's TV shows from the 1960s and 70s in England that none of us have seen because we didn't live in England back then. So we were just kind of stumped how hard it was to get through this kind of informational data set that was meant for children. There's, there's uh, uh, kids' cards and, and adult cards. The adult cards are not as racy as I thought they would be. It's just simpler and, and harder questions. But we found out that the kids' cards are really hard for us to do because they're all about nursery rhymes and books and things that we as German kids never ever read. So that way we learned how it how become learning easier. How can we learn these things? Well, first of all, she's cheating by letting our dog help her all the time. But then we, we just analyze what's going on. There's four things that we do as humans to learn things. We do repetition. A few of those questions, I still don't know what they mean, but I know what the expected answer is right now. So I'm just blurting out the answer and I've won and I can get to the next card. This is a normal thing that people are doing. Comparison. So when something happened in 1982 that we should be remembering, then I, then I compare it like, oh, that Depeche Mode album came out in 1982, so now I know what's going on. Or that football player has a name that's almost connected to that programmer I know, so I now remember that football player's name because I can't be bothered about football. So we compare it to other things. 
explanation. I explained to her, for example, that this, the Magic Roundabout is a TV show in England that we never heard about. She explains to me when we have German cards that, that this is a TV show that I never saw. So we actually explain to each other what's going on. Uh, my favorite is we got the Harry Potter set as well, and it's really, really boring because nobody of us ever makes a mistake, so that's really, really bad to see how much of geeks we're going to become. And Star Wars as well, which, I, which uh, is kind of hard to go through. And association is another thing that humans do. So I remember something by associating with something that I am emotionally invested in or want to understand or actually I'm excited about, which is like, oh, the Harry Potter movie came out in this year, so this, uh, this is now interesting for me because it was the same year. So I associate with something else. But humans are weird creatures. Where computers are organized and very, very simple, we have this tendency to understand something, but then the, the theater in our head comes in. And like five trains of thoughts run against each other and there's weird stuff going on there. My favorite example in the deck was that we're capable of complex and erratic leaps of understanding was that question when it was like, which town hosted the 2005 weddings of Prince Charles and Elton John? And as my partner read that out to me, like uh, the wedding of Prince Charles and Elton John, I was like, when did they marry? <laughs> and I got confused and I got on another track and I didn't know what's going on there anymore. And I wanted to see that. That sounds like a great TV show, but no, it wasn't. What we are bad at is repetition as we're getting bored. So once we knew one of the decks, we basically like, okay, we know all these answers now. Now the game is getting boring because it's not a matter of skill anymore. It's not a matter of learning things anymore. It's just going through the motions and you answer the question while, the, uh, while uh, she's halfway through the question because you already know the answer and then it becomes boring. That's why we don't play the Harry Potter game anymore because nobody makes a mistake. So you just run through the whole board and the other person, oh, you won again. Let me start this time and I will win again. So when it's all about making mistakes, that's the thing. When humans get bored, we make mistakes. That's why repetitive, boring work is dangerous. That's why factory workers get hurt, because they don't use their brain. They're not challenged to do things. They just do the one thing over and over again. And sooner or later, you start drifting away and do something else and staple your finger or something like that. We are actually very, very easily bored. And when we get bored, then we make mistakes. This is also when, when security systems become too easy, then people will use the same password everywhere because we're bored of typing in passwords. And then you get the password once, and you get access to everything that person has. We're also rubbish at adding explanations and naming things, as it is boring too. I remember when I worked for Yahoo and I worked on Flickr. Uh, Flickr was the only photo sharing site out there that was really a community around photos as well. Everybody described their photos and tagged them and explained who's on them and wrote like long descriptions because we wanted to find those photos afterwards as well. Nowadays, up there. No explanation, no tagging, nothing on there. I don't know what photos I took three days ago. I actually hope that my machine does that for me. And it does it. Google Photos, I can type in words that are in another language. And it doesn't, if it doesn't find anything in that language, it translates it to English and does a search with that English word in the background and then shows me the photos that show a cat, show a dog, show an avocado, or whatever I took, the, took photos of. So our searches have worked past our search algorithms and our search systems have worked past our inability to categorize and or, uh, or unwillingness to categorize, tag, and describe things because we've become digital hoarders. We just collect, collect, collect. We're the first one to post something without describing, and we hope somebody else describes it for us. And that doesn't work anymore on that scale. We are easily overwhelmed looking at large tasks and big amounts of data. So if I see like the 600 photos that I've taken, oh God, do I really want to describe all of them? Do I really want to uh, change the color scheme on all of them? I can't. I'm bored. I don't want to have this. The larger a task, the more humans will say, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to spend my time on that. Computers, on the other hand, excel at repetition, and they plow through oodles of data in milliseconds. They love doing the same thing over and over again, and they don't make mistakes because it's easy. It's simple to do, it doesn't take much overhead, it doesn't take much any branching into something else. So doing the same things over and over again is not a problem. And with the, uh, with the speed that we have with computers nowadays and with the availability of storage and the, uh, the, the price of storage, if it's a terabyte, 
it's not that problematic anymore. I mean, my favorite is when I buy a new hard hardware all the time. You get a hard drive, and you're like, one terabyte hard drive. And you're like, I'm never going to fill this. And like four weeks later, it's like 80% full. And you're like, what did I do? It doesn't matter how full the thing is. You always think like, oh, I've got so much data, I can download the, the 4K edition of this, and I do the, these 500 VMs and these 500 ISOs of, of Ubuntu or whatever. We fill everything up to the brim as long as we have it, no matter if we need that data or not. Our job is to make sure that the data that goes through computers and gets analyzed by computers is understood correctly. So we have to teach the machines to understand what this data means. And we have to make sure that we don't make mistakes that causes in, irreparable harm to humans. Like we saw, for example, in, in the other talk earlier, that photos of people of different colors were not tagged as humans, but with animal names. This was because it was badly trained. This was a terrible, terrible mistake. This was a bad training of the data itself. Our job is also, and more importantly to me and to this crowd right now, I think, that the return data is fit for human consumption. It doesn't matter how intelligent the system is. If our interfaces are terrible and not clever about it, then we're not going to use them. And this is where, uh, where uh, the innovation on the web and the cleverness of our systems have overtaken the UIs that we build right now. When I use a search box, I'm still conditioned from years and years ago to use keywords and to use plus symbols and minus symbols and maybe parentheses in Google and all these cool Google hacks that you can have. I shouldn't have to do that. I shouldn't have to think like a computer to get results. I should be able, as a human, to type a sentence in or to speak to my search box. And we do that on mobile, but we don't do it on desktop and uh, larger, uh, larger, uh, larger uh, uh, software pieces yet. This is a very simple sentence that humans understand. Where do I find a nice restaurant around here that's open tomorrow around lunchtime? Now, to make this understandable to a machine, we have to break it up into its components. And the talk that we saw earlier about the chatbots did a really, really good job with that. It was a good primer of natural language processing. But I'm going to repeat a few things here now. The first thing is a restaurant. That is the search term. That is the most important thing in that whole question when it comes to a, a, a database that we should query against it. Somebody wants to know about a restaurant. This is the main thing that, should, that the computer should give me information back. Nice is great for humans, but what does nice mean? As a human, I can say my own personal nice. That's a great restaurant because I had great food there. But a computer cannot know that. So this is a lookup. This is like, OK. Look at the pricing, look at the reviews, look at uh, the loca locality, how close to it is to the search person, and then that might be a nice restaurant. Something like, uh, defining something like nice is really hard for a computer. That's why we need lots and lots of data and lots and lots of other systems where humans said this is nice, then the computer can make an assumption that it's nice too. Here is a location. So, this used to be impossible. You had to write like London, UK, not London, Ontario. And now here is basically, I know where your phone is, great, we know that. I know where your IP is, great, we know that. Except right now my IP is somewhere in Italy for some reason. I don't know what's with the wireless here. Tomorrow around lunchtime is a calculated time frame because lunchtime is different from countries to countries. I mean. In, in some countries, there's not lunch. In others, there's three-hour lunch breaks. So what could be lunch? 12 to 1, 12 to 3. So we need to make assumptions there as well. And then the where is a calculated result. We, sh we show you a restaurant, but we also show you how far away it is from you. Nowadays, we don't expect the search result just to say the name of the restaurant, and then we have to type the search in, uh, in again for that restaurant to know where it is. So normally, a search result in, uh, uh, in Google or Bing is also a search engine. You can Google for that. Uh, shows you the, the restaurant and where it is on a map next to you as well. We expect these kind of things. So our current hype around artificial intelligence is kind of driven by sci-fi concepts. We get all excited about like, ooh, I got Alexa in my house, I got Google in my house, I can talk to Siri, I can talk to Cortana. I love the concept of that we're totally fine with having a camera and, uh, and a, a microphone in our house that continuously records what we're doing. If 10 years ago I had to tell you like, oh, uh, can I put a microphone in your house that records everything you're doing and send it to some random American company? You'd be like, no. 
So, and then like, hey, how about when it tells you the weather? Okay, then it's cool. <laughs> you know, like, look out the window. That's where the weather is. You know, that's not that much of a problem. We are, we are, we are giving away a lot of like uh, information for a very, very small gain. There's this age-old dream of a ubiquitous, all-knowing computer butler, like Star Trek had that, where like, computer, yes, where in the Delta Quadrant are we, and how many phases do we have left, and all these kind of things. And the, the fun thing in, in modern movies, and more, even more modern sci-fi movies, they understand human communication quirks perfectly. So when you see, for example, Iron Man, he always is very sarcastic with his, uh, uh, with his Jarvis, and the, the computer then gives sarcastic answers which makes for a good screenplay on screen, but wouldn't make any sense. I don't want Cortana to be sarcastic or to be coy about something. I just want to have the information about it. Uh, I just talked about, uh, uh, I love that there's an HTML5, there's an, AP, uh, there's an API for video play. And there is a, uh, there's an API call set can play. And then a mime type of the video that you want to play. And in the, a in the W3C standard, there's three answers to that one. It's empty string, Probably or maybe. This is bullshit. I don't want to have computers like that. I don't want computers to ask me riddles and do these kind of things. I just want them to give me the information I came for. Computers to me are like a shovel. I don't give them any more respect than a tool that I drill a hole with. But we make them into these magical things because, computer, uh, because TV and movies have told us for years this is what computers are. These butlers are human are not human, but they're as human and try to be human, and that is always creepy. I don't want to have something that pretends to be human. I want to have humans with all their mistakes, with all their uh, odors, with all their problems. This is what we are. we are. We are mammals. We are actually animals on this planet that just use computers instead of simulating other humans around them. And this is when it comes to AI and artificial intelligence, we are always setting ourselves up for failure by trying to catch that all-knowing thing in the sky that is the artificial intelligence. This is nothing we need. You don't need to build Cortana. You don't need to build Siri. You need to actually build interfaces that at that moment, in that context, give your end users the result as fast as possible and as sensible as possible and maybe some other results that they might want to look at. Ubiquitous computing easily becomes a nuisance when it records without giving you the right answers. It's so much fun seeing people talk to their Alexa when it answers something wrong because they get really angry really quickly. And it's beautiful that, that we, you give somebody a, a great thing like Google Home or you give them Cortana or Siri. People ask like three questions and then are super excited about how clever that thing is. And then everybody asks that one question where it makes a mistake. And then we're like, haha, I'm cleverer than your computer. You know, I paid nine hundred dollars for you, but I'm still cleverer than you. You know, I give you all my data, but I'm cleverer than you. So we we seem to need that uh, uh, that extra level of like we use these things for everything. I don't know what's going on, but I'm better than it. It's very easy to create a creepy, annoying chatbot, and we're not as forgiving with them as we are with humans. I don't shout at people on telephones when they give me the answer wrongly, but with a chatbot, I'm like, I can't do this any longer. Just give me a human. I love these automated systems when like press one for this, two for this, three for this. I always press the one that doesn't exist because that gets you faster to a human answering you. Because most of the time the error case is not defined in those things. Artificial intelligence is most effective when it enhances in the background. As I said, when in Google Photos or whatever our system is, I don't even know it, uh, I, I, I enter Katze in German and I never tagged a photo with Katze. I have cat photos. It realized, okay, he's looking for cats and no result. He's looking, uh, let's translate it into English. It's cat. For cat, we have, a, we have a model that actually compares the photos with the shape of a cat. And here's your photos of cats. Selfie is a category as well that I would never actually dare to tag something as selfie because it's embarrassing. But I have selfies on there because that's what you do, try to be fitting in with the young kids. So again, how does learning get easier? Repetition, comparison, explanation, and association. Now, repetition and comparison, computers are much, much better than we are, and this is what we should be using them for. This is the one that we should ship out to computers and say, like, you know what, do that stuff for me. Is this photo really a photo of a cat? 
compare it to the trillions of photos in, in Bing search or Google search, and then I know it's actually a cat rather than me having to guess that's a cat. Of course, there's these wonderful things where you got like marshmallow or corgi or uh, uh, and these, like, uh, these dogs that look like things. So computers get as confused as humans are about these things. But it's amazing how well these things are. In map systems, I can actually type in how far is here from the capital of Denmark. And it will find where here is. It will check up the, the capital of Denmark is Copenhagen. And then it will show me the map of the result of that. It's interesting. The other day, I wanted to show a demo where I said, like, OK, we watched, uh, we watched Harry Potter again. And I'm like, how much taller is Helena Bonham Carter than um, Hermione, whatever her name is right now? Um, and the answer, the answer of Google was, did you mean then with an E instead of an A? So it didn't give me the answer, and it corrected my grammar to be wrong. <laughs> and this taught me that, that this taught me, teach me, <laughs> this taught me that probably too many people in Google searches get then and then wrong. So now Google assumes that the wrong then is the right then. And this is something we want to be worried about. If, if, if human mistakes become something that the computer appreciates more because it's used more, then we should use this thing more in the proper fashion because we don't want to teach computers wrong things. Now, here are the things that we do with artificial intelligence in them or deep learning in them or comparative in them, whatever you want to call it. These are the things I want you to use in your systems in the near future, if not right now, and you all can use them. They're not magical, amazing things that only a few data scientists can do. They're, they're here for you to use already. There's visual recognition, there's voice recognition, there's natural language processing, there's emotion recognition and entity recognition. And I'm going to go through the positives and the negatives of all of them when it comes to building interfaces with them with humans. So visual recognition is the first thing. What is in a picture? The positive of that one is it's automated tagging and clustering of images. You can upload thousands of photos and say, like, make me folders or databases with all the pictures of women, all the pictures of men, all the pictures of cats, all the pictures of dogs. Show me all the photos that actually show more than two persons, more than three people, and so on and so forth. These are painful things to do by hand, super annoying, super boring. Computers are much better at that and doing those things. Image to text handwriting. I love that I can, uh, well, I don't because I can't read my handwriting, but uh, I see people using this machine to do handwriting with a pencil and it becomes a Word document in the background. Because for some people, handwriting is much faster than typing things in. I'm, I'm horrible at handwriting, that's why I'm f typing faster, but for other people that makes total sense. Or you have all kind of, the other day I had a, a project where we had, um, uh, notes from the, uh, from the Nuremberg uh, uh, trial after the Second World War that were all written in the old German handwriting, not in the new one. So we actually, sp we actually wrote a model to teach the computer to read that old thing, and there's a lot of information that came out of that that never was recorded before because it was only on paper in like badly scanned documents. Alternative content, uh, uh, which is very important for accessibility. Blind users cannot see that it's a cat, so it needs a text in there saying, this is a cat. But people are too lazy for doing that, so a computer can do that. This is happening in Facebook. If in Facebook it says, image may contain, this was done by a computer. This was not, not done by a human. There was already a deep neural network going through that. Biometric login. I love looking into my computer and log, uh, and log in. Why do I have to type a password every single time? Why do I have to uh, type a pin every single time? If it recognizes my face, fine. And this one has three cameras in there. It's got in two angles, so you cannot show a photo of me. And it's got an infrared camera that checks that I'm alive. So uh, if I were dead and you would remove my head and go in front of my computer, that wouldn't work either. This is good. This is something that makes me co feel comfortable about it. And it's quite fun that this has been around for years now. And if Apple puts into iOS 11, out of a sudden, people are like, oh my god, that's amazing. Like, Samsung had that before us, and Xerox showed it in the 1970s already. And automated art direction is an interesting one as well, where when you have to generate lots of thumbnails of images, for example, you don't want the big image just to be resized into a smaller image, because that means nothing. What you want to do is detect, for example, a face or the outline of a person and then crop the thumbnail around that and then resize only that part. And that can be done by lots of services and lots of uh, uh, pre-trained data already for you. 
and automated moderation. There's stuff in images that humans should not see. Computers are totally okay with seeing them, so it actually makes more sense to get this stuff deleted before it goes on the web and your company is known to show something that should not be shown to humans. So it's actually a good idea to let computers see the terrible things that humans uploaded rather than other humans having to do that. Now the negatives, of course, are privacy issues. When my face gets detected in a photo that I don't want to necessarily be tagged on and it gets automatically tagged, then I have a problem. I love this comic where it says like a picture of Superman and it says like, uh, <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to tag Clark Kent? And she's like, whoa, what? Superman is Clark Kent? Now the computer told me. Uh, wrong, uh, wrong and possibly offensive automated labeling. We had that before when, like, uh, in the New Zealand, uh, uh, when in New Zealand, when somebody scanned their passport, it was an Asian person saying, like, please don't close your eyes when you take a photo. That's bad. That's hurtful. That's wrong. False moderation and failed moderation. So if something still gets through or something gets moderated, although it's not that bad. Connection upload latency, when I upload a photo and it takes ages to get recognized and then it gives me the data back, that's not fun either. And insufficiently trained models that, that just don't know what an Asian person is because all the photos that were uploaded up front and taught the machine what a human is were only white people. So that's bad. Voice recognition, that's the big thing. Everybody wants to talk to their computer and everybody shows like how cool it is to talk to their computer. The positives are visual impairment on no screen. I know blind users that have been talking to their phones the last 15 years. Uh, not even smartphones, even phones that had like extra software before that, even phones that were built for that purpose. Hands-free interaction on, the f uh, on their phone, in the car, or on headsets. In the car, you should not actually type on your phone, but it's totally okay if you talk to your phone and say, like, uh, change the navigation to the other restaurant that I don't want to go to before. Why you would have to work in a car is another thing. Maybe we should just let ourselves get some free time from time to time and not do anything for work. That's probably a good idea as well. It's faster than typing. It's more natural. Talking to a machine and getting the text generated for me is sometimes much, much easier. That's why when you watch like 1950s movies, people have these dictaphones and then gave it to their secretary to type it up. Some people think better when they talk rather than just typing it themselves. It has this magical Star Trek factor. It's the ubiquitous cool computer that helps me. The negative are it's intrusive as hell. If everybody talks to their machine and talks to their computer next to it, it's super annoying. I mean, people on the phone next to you when you're sitting on a train, you just want to slap them. And 300 people in the office only talking to machines would be impossible because the error rate is just far too high. And you, don't want, you can type something without people seeing it, but you can't talk to your phone without people hearing it. So it's probably a privacy thing as well. Disappointing error handling. If a voice recognition doesn't work, it feels hurtful. If you talk to somebody, they don't understand you, it feels like, what did I do wrong? And I'm clever, the computer should be cleverer. Language and accent issues and low sound quality or loud surroundings and latency and recognition again. If I talk to my phone and I see the spinning thing for like 15 seconds, I feel like, why didn't I type it? Because that's not convenience. Natural language processing, allowing for real sentences to go in and people to say like, where's the capital of Denmark or how far away am I away from the capital of Denmark. It allows humans to ask human questions. When we built, uh, I was an engineer on Yahoo Answers, that's what we did. We wanted to allow uh, humans to answer humans. Okay, it completely went belly up, but uh, it, was a, it was an alternative to the keyword search that we did before. Proper translation of content, not word by word, but by meaning. Google has done this and we have done it as well, that instead of having a translation that only does a word by word and then random stuff comes out, it also translates the full sentence again afterwards to get some better results out of this. Conversational interfaces that keep the user engaged. That's why we go back to chatbots where actually sometimes when it works, it's fun to talk to Cortana. It's fun to talk to Siri. The negatives. Users are conditioned to think in clicks and actually in keywords. We don't trust a search form to allow me to actually type a sentence in. I feel stupid doing that or I feel it's too much work. But if a properly trained NLP system will get you a better result for a full sentence than for keywords. So you really want to think about uh, putting these into your systems. Language differences are still a problem. Not all people speak English. It's weird, but uh, it, it happens. 
emotion recognition in images, in a video, in audio, uh, in video, in audio, and in text. That's a very, very important thing because there's a lot of benefits for you to to know if something is a happy uh, a happy thing or an unhappy thing. In essence, it's a great feedback channel for product tests. We have, when we do user testing, we have an interviewer next to the user playing with it, but the camera is also doing facial recognition on the person, seeing when they're actually get happy and unhappy. So we see if they just want to please the interviewer or if they're really happy about it. Also, self uh, uh, cars having a camera in them and realizing when you get tired and then actually getting slower or telling you to actually make a break, that's a good idea as well. React to the most annoyed customers first when it comes to comments. When you get like 600,000 comments a day, you want to answer those who are most annoyed first because that gets them out of the way of putting more comments in because those people are dedicated. So those are the people that want their answer first. The same way a, a, a positive answer warrants something that you promote these people and say like, well, thank you for your positive answer and here is a benefit of 20% off next time or something like that finding happy quotes and customers to promote, and navigate media by emotion. I don't want to see the sad parts of the interview. I want to see the happy parts of the interview. And I'm going to show you something later on that does that for you. The negatives, of course, is false recognition results and hurtful messaging. If, you, if somebody is sad and you're like, well, you seem happy, here's 20% off of your, uh, of your thing that wasn't delivered, that's even more hurtful than anything else. Uh, quality issues can result in very wrong results. People are like, okay, I wasn't happy, but you said I was happy, or I was sarcastic, that wasn't actually positive, that was actually very, very negative, which we love to do. Voice emotion recognition is still a tough one to crack, because sarcasm sounds a lot happy. Like, we do, we, we, it is a false happiness, so we have to find out what the falseness of it is there. And last one is entity recognition. That's very simple, like, hey, this photo is the Eiffel Tower. This photo is obviously the Taj Mahal and these kind of things. So known things in texts, known things in videos, known things in images. The positives of that one is automated tagging and cross-referencing. So when there's a picture of the, uh, uh, of the Eiffel Tower, you can pop up and say like, hey, here's the more information about the Eiffel Tower. I love uh, Amazon's X-Ray for videos that way. If you turn that on and you watch a movie, it actually shows you, oh, this actor just came in. By the way, he's also in those movies and he was born in that and these kind of things. That's so cool. That's the stuff that I do when I watch movies. I got Wikipedia open on my computer and watch the movie and look up people when they're coming on screen and Amazon does that for me now. Maybe I'm weird, but okay. Intelligent autocomplete. If I type in Eiffel Tower, it probably should know that something about Paris is going to come next, that the postcode that I will type in is not an American postcode, but it's going to be a French one, and these kind of extra things that I can give, it, give the user out there. Negative is actually false recognition, language differences, lack of value of un automated content. So this is not that much of an issue when something goes wrong there, it just looks wrong, and then you give people an opportunity to report it so next time it doesn't get tagged wrongly anymore. Now here's the good news, or a very pragmatic insight. All of this has been done for you. All these, these systems are available for you from Google, from Facebook, from Amazon, from Microsoft, from a smaller startups, all these kind of things. We all have APIs for you to use to do these kind of things already there. And you should be tying into those because uh, artificial, uh, deep learning is a, a big numbers game. You don't have the computing power. You don't have the machines and the speed to actually do these kind of things. So it makes more sense to use a cloud-hosted computer and pay two cents for an hour of computing than get your own machine and then you can fry eggs on it. I mean, a lot of stuff you can locally, you can do locally, but it makes much more sense to, to use the computing power we have in the cloud for these kind of things. I'm saying that now, but it's actually moving towards hardware already. Intel is working on a lot of chipsets that have uh, deep learning algorithms or predefined models already on them. Facial recognition and voice recognition is built into the newest Apple hardware as well. So these things are getting back into the hardware as well. But for now, I think the best option is to take computing power that you don't need to own and you don't need to maintain, which is even more important. We always talk about this golden calf of code that everybody has to learn programming and code is the main thing and only code counts. 
Yeah, to a degree. Of course you can write your own deep neural network, of course you can do your own facial recognition algorithm, but if it's something as trivial, trivial as that when it comes to AI, use something that already exists, because you don't want to reinvent the wheel over and over again, because I want you to build interfaces for humans to do things to do things with, not to actually repeat again what other people have done. If you want to see something really impressive that uses all of that in there, uh, it's called Video Indexer. And what it does, it gives you a video that you can upload. And then it, an hour later or something, sometimes 50 minutes later, gets an email, everything is done. In this case, it was a trailer of the Batman uh, uh, Night, Dark Knight Rises, a behind the scenes featurette. And what it did, it, dis it found all the actors or the people who are speaking in the video and gives you a little image of it. If these are known entities, in this case like Gary Oldman, it also gives you the cross-reference to Bing and like uh, uh, these kind of things, and shows you a timeline of the video when that person is in the video. It also took the audio of, the, uh, of it, converted it to text, and did a keyword analysis on it, and a, a sentiment analysis on it, so you can jump to the happy parts, the positive or the negative parts of the video there. You also get a transcript, where you can, oh, the tabs are not visible, you get a transcript of the whole video that then gets live translated into other languages. So you can get your transcript of your video in nine languages. This is nuts. And this is beautiful. And YouTube has similar things. If you upload a YouTube video and define the language, it creates some, uh, some uh, 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 captioning for you as well, actually subtitling, not captioning. And then you have an editor where you can uh, edit only the things that went wrong, rather than having to type the whole transcript yourself. Cloudinary is a company in Israel that does a lot of image analysis stuff, and they, for example, build a WordPress plugin. So now when you have a WordPress blog and you put the, this in there, it automatically gives alternative text for your images. It actually crops the, the thumbnails around the faces. It gives you all kind of filters on your images, all these things that you can do. If you don't want to use systems, but you actually want to do something yourself, there's REST APIs for all of that. So it does, we don't even have to go into the fight which language to use. We all know it's JavaScript, but we, we, we don't have to test. There's, there's Python, there's C Sharp, there's Java, there's all these kind of things. It's an HTTP REST API that you send an image to, or you send an audio file to, or you send a URL to to get the audio file from, and then you tell it what to do. This is our cognitive services, the uh, uh, IBM's Bluemix does a lot of stuff with Watson, Google has a lot of them as well. They all differ a bit in what they give you back, but they all work the same way. So in this case, for example, you, uh, you take an image and you upload it and it tells you, okay, there's a man in there, he's 28 years old is what we guess, and uh, there's actually, it's not adult content, although he's naked, but it's uh, it probably categories of people swimming. You get a description, which is now, uh, that's actually a bug. I have to uh, get a new screenshot of that. A description would be like man swimming in water, because you have like sport swimming, you have pool, you have all these things that it found out. It gave you a confidence from zero to, uh, to one what these things are. It also found out that it's a JPEG. That's easy to do with the EXIF data. It analyzes the colors of the image and says, like, this is the predominant color, this is the background color. So if you want to show a, a, a color rectangle before you load the photo, that's something you can do. The emotion recognition does similar things. It gives you uh, then the anger, contempt, disgust, fear, happiness, neutral sadness from zero to one. So that way you can, uh, you can cluster images accordingly as well. And this is what I said, that's all repetition and comparison with millions and millions of photos, audio files, video files that we all uploaded over the years. Now, what does the future hold? Where do we want to go with this? Because mistakes are being made by computers, so we want to make sure that our data is understood in a human fashion. So the explanation and association bit are the next set of APIs that are coming in right now. There is the Language Understanding Intelligence Service, uh, Lewis, that gives you a graphical interface to type in sentences and say what is what in those, like we had before. What is an entity? What is a search term? What is a variable? It supports these languages and it allows you to write a, uh, uh, to write a thesaurus or a, a lexicon of your, uh, of your specialist terms. So a book might mean something else in another context. That way you can teach the computer not to say that's just a book. 
The custom vision service does the same thing. You can upload images in bulk, and then you can train them and say, like, please look for these differences. Look for recognizing now uh, spices rather than cats. And here is three examples, five examples, what a spice looks like. Now go through the rest, and then recursively go through it better and better until it becomes better over time. The custom speech service does the same thing. I've done that the other day with an with a airport where they had a voice recognition thing which didn't work at all because it was noisy. So we recorded 80 hours of background noise, what's happening in that airport, and then threw it at the Chris system and said like, okay, this is the stuff you shouldn't care about. Everything else you should care about. So out of the sudden, the quality went up to 80% because it, the computer knew what not to understand or what to discard. Now, intelligent systems will not go away. I think, if anything, they'll be part of the platform soon. iOS 11 shows that already. Uh, ARKit and Google does similar things as well. Chipsets are coming out that have these kind of algorithms already built in. So you can be part of this and create human interfaces for all and make people not be afraid of it, make people not be afraid to ask computer human questions and get human answers back to, make, to get the, the intelligence out of the equation and just make it a sensible thing to have. We can hope that others use this power only for good. Of course, that's always a thing to do. But I, I don't consider it a good bet. Uh, I, I want to be in control. I want to be part of this revolution, even if I continuously feel stupid. When I go to our data scientists, to our research labs, and I talk to those people, I'm like, I know JavaScript, I can make things bounce on a screen. Cool, I like cheese. But, you know, but a lot of them can't talk to humans, so they need people like me to help them see what people really need. And it's so exciting, it's so much more exciting than using yet another JavaScript framework or, uh, or discussing for 16 hours if a for loop in this syntax is faster than a for loop in that syntax. This is a new challenge that's happening right now. And I want you all to take it on with the help of systems that others have built for you already. And that's all I had, so thanks very much. So we have, we have actually a couple of questions. I will ask you the most interesting ones, if that's OK. No. <laughs> then I will ask all of you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, I forgot about that. There is a. Um, yeah, yeah, you can ask. So what I'm happens to, to my computer out? There was a Microsoft chatbot, you know uh -huh. which I mean, and it started insulting people. So the question was, um, do you know what happened? That chatbot worked perfectly. <laughs> That's the sad part of it. We, we, we threw this thing out to show what human communication on the internet is right now. And the people who talk to it are by the most horrid people on this planet who had too much time on their hand. So you cannot blame a system if only the wrong data goes in. There's far too many people that live in their mother's basement, don't have any happiness in their life, and their whole life is trolling other people online. And when a company like Microsoft brings something out like that, the biggest joy in their life is to take this down as soon as possible. So in terms of technique, uh, uh, in terms of code quality and what the thing did, it, it worked perfectly. It was horrid what it did, but that's, then we realized actually, okay, this is what the internet is right now, and it taught us a lot about our moderation systems and our other systems. And we had a lot of people coming in that actually write chatbots to help us with it as well. Google and other people, and our, also us, we actually hire poets and, uh, uh, and singers and dancers and people like that that do very human things to teach to computers that normal people wouldn't. So it's very good if something like that goes wrong, because then it doesn't have to go wrong in a live system. Very good, one more. So uh, let's finish on a positive note. Due to the machine and bots are replacing annoying, boring, repetitive job, will our profession be overwhelmed in future of too many engineers or developers in it? No. Uh, well, no, maybe. I don't know. Uh, um, the, the question is, are we, uh, uh, are we uh, uh, safe from automation? And I can 100% say no. It's just take a look what people are doing. We are using 12 NPM modules and a, 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 a library on top of it, and then we build a template, and that's how we make websites. You don't need a coder for that. 
an artificial, a, a, deep, a deep neural network saying like 60, comp, uh, 60 different websites use this framework with those NPM modules. This must be the right way of doing it. Can do that already. Wix, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, what you see is what you get, editor, make your own website thing. They have one that actually uh, gets content into your page based on a artificial intelligence. So there's a lot of stuff going that way as well. We're not invincible from that. And you know what? I'm happy with that. I don't want to do repetitive coding. Don't repeat yourself has been a long thing that we told to ourselves. So we will also be, I, I, I hope that in five to 10 years time, 90% of our job is not being coding, but actually solving problems and letting the computers do the coding for us. And I'm looking forward to that as well, because then we can do other things. Sooner or later, I want to be, to do only things that only humans can do. And we should use computers and automation to make it as cheap as possible to have a normal life for everybody, then we actually have the freedom to be humans. And I, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you, Chris. So, it's really a positive note. I, I would like to invite all of the fellow colleagues of Vox Belgrade to come on the stage. Applause. So you're used to these letters. We only changed the number, right? Um, thank you all for, for coming to Vox This Belgrade 2017. This is the next big thing, I assure you. Um, I'm so happy that uh, we had um, a lot of you here in these last two days. I'm super grateful to all speakers who were standing on the stage for the last two days. I'm also happy for the sponsors. They had a really good time. Uh, you really, um, you were always there on their boots and they really appreciate that. Uh, I hope that you will have time to fill out um, a short follow-up form. Um, we appreciate that only because we cannot do it better if you don't share what you think. So please be honest. Don't tell us we are great. I said that last night. So if you tell us we are great, we're not making this. We will not be making this. So please do criticize us. Tell us what's wrong. Uh, tell us what's good. Please do. Uh, suggest which speakers you would like to see on HeapCon. Uh, if you'd like to uh, be a part of HeapSpace, you can always write something on info at heapspace.rs. You can tell us if you want to do a project with us or anything similar. Uh, a huge thanks to Production Pool, one of our sponsors this year. Sanyin, please wave. So Production Pool has been our partner for two years now and they made the live stream happen. They made um, everything work from the technical side. Um, and now I would like, of course, the team. You've seen the team. <laughs> One applause for them. Uh, I'm super proud that everything functioned very well. We had a couple of hiccups on the first day. I hope that none of you were affected. We will try to make it even better next year. Um, and now, um, probably the most important guys at this conference and girls are our volunteers. Can you please come up on the stage? So we have students for, from, I think, six or more faculties. Uh, this year we have um, anthropologists here at the tech conference. We have biologists. I think we have chemists as well. I'm not sure. Um, of course, we have guys from um, Faculty of Organizational Sciences, uh, from ETF, from Electrotechnical School of Engineering. Um, so we've been very happy with them. Uh, I hope that they... Um, that they were there if you had any questions. Um, and a huge thanks to you. So we are doing all of this because of you. Uh, I hope that we will meet next year. If I forgot someone, 
Um, please don't be mad. I'm super tired. We've been doing this for the past two year, two days, and for the for for two. Uh, okay, so I'm I'm gone crazy completely. So two days of setup, two days of the conference, and eight months before that in preparing everything. So dinner is served. We have a rock band playing after. We have Rosa Rakia, which you should definitely try. We have beer. So have fun. Thanks a lot.